All right, welcome back, guys. So we're going to kind of wrap up the story of the Greek world today by looking at this next element of Greek society, the Greek culture, right? The science, the math, the writers. Uh, that is a part of Greek history as well. So while we did spend a lot of time on the politics and on the wars, I do want you to know a few things here about just the Greek writers um, and some of the key people that, that we know of in terms of ancient Greek history. So let's start with a few of the names and people you'll need to know. So you've got these few names that we're going to start with, and there'll be another set of writers specifically from Athens. These are kind of the non-Athenians. Uh, so we'll start with them and some of the earlier people as well. So we'll start with Homer. Uh, we talked about Homer before. You know, he wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey. So I'm just kind of mentioning him as one of the earlier writers that we have in the Greek world. And then we have, of course, these two other individuals uh, that you haven't heard of before, Thales and Anaximander. Now, these two men, they're both from Miletus. I'm going to start with Thales, then I'll get to Anaximander. Um, and these are not writers. They're instead what we would call today scientists. So I'm not going to say a lot about them, but you know, whatever I tell you about them, you want to know, obviously. So Thales, um, he is, um, and if you remember where Miletus was on the coast of Asia Minor there, um, and so Thales, he was sometimes known as the father of science, right, in, in the sense that he developed some of the very advanced early ideas of science. For example, he was able to predict eclipses on a regular basis. So, you know, that kind of shows that, you know, he understands the, the you know, astronomy quite well. He was able to calculate the heights of the pyramids in Egypt, so he obviously understands mathematics really well. But his biggest claim to fame, a third thing, is he understood the idea of elements. Now, when we think of elements today, we think of the periodic table and all the elements associated with it. For Thales, these elements were more of the most basic stuff like fire, earth, water, air, and he believed water was the key element that made everything work. So, you know, just a kind of an interesting idea that he's already starting to think about these greater things and making and these smaller things and making bigger things. So that would be Thales. His student was Anaximander, and also from Miletus, and both Thales and Anaximander, they're the 600 BC period. I didn't put down the dates here, but if you want to get them down, 600 BC, roughly circa uh, for both these guys, Thales and Anaximander, Homer was a little bit earlier. Uh, and both uh, Anaximander, who was also from Miletus, his biggest kind of claim to fame was he once said, man comes from sea-like creatures. And what he's getting at is, of course, evolution, right? Man comes from sea-like creatures. He's getting to the idea of evolution. Now, when we think of evolution, we usually think of Darwin, and that is in the like, what, 1800s AD. Uh, so he's doing this centuries earlier, but it is still pretty cool that he at least thinks about it. Doesn't develop it the way Darwin does, but he's still processing where did we come from in, in that sense. So that's pretty cool. Uh, he writes about ideas of gravity, and when we think of gravity, we often think of Newton, and he's many, many centuries before Newton. He talks about other worlds existing. So again, Anaximander clearly had a pretty good grasp of science. All right, so Thales and Anaximander, my guess is a lot of you have never heard of before, but you've probably all heard of Pythagoras. And Pythagoras comes from a place called Croton, uh, which is actually in southern Italy, but remember that was part of the Greek world in many respects. And he's in the more 500s BC period, so now we're kind of moving into the 500s. And we've all heard of Pythagoras for an obvious reason, the... Pythagorean theorem, right? Terrible, but a squared plus b squared equals c squared, right? So we've all heard this before, and this is one of the really good examples of a contribution, right? So what do we get from the Greeks that impact the world today? Well, obviously, we still use the Pythagorean theorem. And then not just for your math class, it's practically used for building and for communication and travel and all that. So this is a good example when you're doing your contribution chart to add Pythagoras. Uh, there are others, you know, Archimedes, other mathematicians. We still use their mathematics today, so that, that's pretty cool. So most people are famous, uh, uh, know Pythagoras for his ideas of the Pythagorean theorem, but there are a couple other interesting developments in, in that he develops also. Um, so there's three things. There's the Pythagorean theorem. There is this kind of understanding of the use of the number 10 and how through the number 10 you could do higher level maths. Obviously, I'm not a math expert, but this is something he seemed to develop. 
But then the more interesting thing he also seems to come up with is this idea of how music and math relate. And I don't know if any of you play a musical instrument, but if you think about it, is there math with music? And the answer is obviously yes, right? You know, if you, you, if you know music, math really well, you can create better music. And Pythagoras understood this kind of harmony of numbers to create music. So anyways, you have Pythagoras. All right, uh, so those are a few of the kind of scientists, scientists, kind of mathematicians guys there, Thales, Anaximander, and Pythagoras. All right, get them all down. Then we have uh, Hesoid. Hesoid is from the region of Boeotia. Um, he is around set six, 700, about 600 BC, about 650 BC. Um, and his biggest work, he wrote a few things, but the one I want you to know is this work called the Theogony. What is the theogony? So that's the person, that's where he's from, theogony. Theogony is um, about the Greek gods, theo, theology, right? And it's kind of who's who are the Greek gods. And it's very useful because, you know, how do we know about Greek religion? Uh, Zeus, Apollo, Medusa, all these great stories that, you know, Clash of the Titan. Well, we know about them from Homer's, from the stories, from Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey, from Hesoid's Theogony. So it's kind of a good little who's who of the Greek gods. The Greeks don't have an Old Testament or New Testament, like a Bible. So we kind of picked a piece together the story of the Greek gods from the various tales and writings and so forth. So he saw it's pretty cool for that reason. All right, then you have this term lyric poetry. So what is lyric poetry? Because I'm going to give you another writer here in a second. We'll go to the next slide. Um, but lyric poetry is a very famous style of poetry that comes out from the Greeks. Homer wrote poetry. His poetry was epic poetry. It's long. What is lyric poetry? Lyric poetry is played to music, an instrument called a lyre, which is kind of a tiny little harp-like instrument. And you, you play it to, you know, songs, music, it's short. Um, and it's not that, that big. You can write lyric poetry about anything. So I want to share with you one lyric poet. So in the next slide, we'll get this next person's name down. A lyric poet by the name of Sappho. Right. So here we see Sappho. Right. And, you know, one of the things I want you to notice about Sappho, I put a mosaic up of Sappho because Sappho is a she, not a he. And Sappho wrote lyric poetry as well. Now, when you write with the lyric poetry she wrote about, you could write lyric poetry about anything. What lyric poetry did she write about? Well, let me show you where Sappho was from. So here you have her image. And now I'm going to show you the map of where Sappho is from. And then you'll see what lyric poetry she wrote about. So here we go. Here's a map. And as you can see there, it says the island of Lesbos. And it's right up here. And the answer to all of your questions right now is yes. That is where we get the word from. So, yes, yeah, she comes from the island of Lesbos. And her lyric poetry was about female friendships. And that's why you get the word lesbian. So, you know, you got all these words in our English language that I've taught you. Ostracism and draconian. Uh, we'll get a couple others. Uh, in Agora, Acropolis. Uh, all these words we have, uh, Odyssey, um, so here's another one, you know, lesbian, that's where it comes from. So that's what her lyric poetry was about, so, you know, students always get kind of a little kick out of that. All right, uh, so there you go. So those are some of the early writers and scientists I want you to know about. We're not done, because there's also a lot of Greek writers that, of course, come from Athens. And so let me go to our next slide here. And these are the Athenians, so get all this down, right? I'll kind of talk about a couple of them and then move on to the next slides to show you some things. But what we're going to do here is look at the Athenian writers and we're doing a couple things here. So let me set this up. Um, we're comparing Athens and Sparta still, right? And when we talked about the Spartans, if you remember, Sparta had one writer, right? And you want to know a man named Tarathius. He's in the Spartan lecture. Athens had a lot, right? And there were a lot of writers, a lot of people. Some of these are named the plays, some of these are named the writers. So I'll explain that as we go through it. Um, and so we're going to go through these, but when we go through them, understand that there are a lot more. And so when you're doing your kind of possible essay on Athens Sparta, yeah, you say Sparta had one writer, you give an example. You said Athens had a lot of writers, you give examples, and then you can incorporate these sources in these, these, these um, examples, right? So the other thing I'm doing is these are all writers in Athens, specifically in the 400s, right? The 5th century. And if you remember, 
We just talked about how there were three generations, right? If you remember, it was 490 to 460. We had the marathon generation. Then, you know, from 460 to 430, we had the golden age. And then from 430 to 400, oops, to 400, we had that age of rust, right? If you remember that politically. And each of those generations, you know, was very different in Athens. And the writing reflects that. Uh, we kind of see this in U.S. history, if you think about it, how writing reflects a time period. 1920s, Great Gatsby, right? Roaring 20s, 1930s, Grapes of Wrath, right? Depression. 1940s cartoons, very patriotic because we're fighting, you know, Hitler and the Nazis. Uh, 1980s, you know, Cold War, a lot of themes with Cold War. Um, you know, Rocky movies, Rocky IV, fighting the Russian, right? That world classic game, movie War Games. Uh, even if you've watched any of the new seasons of like uh, Stranger Things, some of you, if you remember that series um, on TV, that it's current, but it was set in the 1980s and it's all about the Cold War, right? Connecting the things with the Russians. So anyways, you, you see how oftentimes the politics relate to uh, the, the writing reflects the politics. And we see this in Athens as well. So let's start going through some of these names. We'll start with this first guy named Aeschylus. Aeschylus actually fought at the Battle of Marathon. So he's obviously part of that Marathon generation. He is from Athens. And his most famous work is called Prometheus. It is Aeschylus who we give a lot of credit to for starting this whole genre of the Greek tragedy. You know, what you read in Sophocles and Antigone and all that. Aeschylus is the first person to write in that genre. And the story of Prometheus, just to kind of know a little bit about it, is essentially the story of Prometheus stealing fire from the gods and giving it to man. But he gets caught doing this and he's punished. He's punished by them putting him on a boulder and this vulture or bird comes, pecks out his innards every day and then he grows back and then he's just eternally tortured. What does this have to do with the time period? Well, remember, this is the time of the Persian War. And many people who know this story better than I do say that this is kind of a symbolic story Aeschylus is writing as Athens being the underdog fighting against this mighty Persian, standing up to the man, the big powerful Persian force, you know, big bad. And that's what Prometheus is doing, standing up to big bad, the gods. Um, so that's essentially what Aeschylus is trying to portray here in this story. So that's one guy from the first generation. That's all you need to know about. I'm not doing a lot of detail on all this, obviously. Uh, the other writer of Athens during the first generation, so these are the two guys I want you to know from, from the marathon generation, Aeschylus and Pindar. Pindar was technically born in Thebes, but did write much of his writing over here in Athens, so I kind of just group him with the Athenians. And Pindar, like Sappho, wrote lyric poetry. Unlike Sappho, his lyric poetry was more about athletic competitions, right? So he wrote about a lot of athletic competitions, and especially the ancient Olympic Games, right? So I'm going to show you some pictures of Olympic Games. So make sure I'm going to move out the slide in a second. So if you don't have all the rest of these names down, get them down. I'm going to talk about them as we move through the rest of the slides. Uh, but just a quick little tangent, another contribution we get from the ancient Greeks is the story of the ancient Olympic Games. Uh, so, yes, Pindar wrote, and but I'm going to kind of give you another contribution from the Greeks as we talk about Olympics. Um, we still have the Olympics today, and if you ever go to Greece, you can actually see, you know, where the Olympic Games were held. So let me show you some pictures. So this is Olympia. This is where they light the flame every four years before the Olympic Games start. So right here in this kind of little roped off area, you can see they light a flame every four years. So you have that. This is the track stadium where the ancient Olympic athletes ran. And this is kind of funny. You see these podiums here as they enter the track. So this is them entering the track. And you have these podiums. And these podiums apparently is where they put the sculptures of the cheaters. Uh, so remember that shame culture? So if you were to come in, you know, as the athletes went in, you see you're forever shamed if you're caught cheating. Uh, right? Maybe we should do that in like all our courses. I mean, students caught cheating, they'd be like put up on the internet or something. I think we're allowed to do that. But you get the idea, right? Uh, um, uh, so this shame culture of them. So they enter the stadium, and then over here you actually see the track, right? And here's this big grass area. All the fans would sit in that area, and the athletes would simply run on this track here that you could see here. They just go wee, and they'd run up and down the track. What's really cool is if you ever visit Olympia, I took these pictures when I was there, 
you can run on this track. So there I am, ready to go, right, in Olympia, and I you know, run, run on that track there. So that's a lot of fun. So anyway, so we do have the Olympic Games. That's something we get from the Greeks. Another contribution, Pindar wrote a lot of athletic odes. So uh, before we go on what's next, there are a few other Greek writers I want you to know. So I'll just leave this map and then tell you what's next. So let's go through the other ones I had up there. The Sophists, these again are Athenians. The Sophists, uh, if you have that term there, are Athenian writers during the second period, the second generation, the Golden Age, the period of Pericles. And these guys were, you know, very arrogant. And it makes sense they're very arrogant because this is a very arrogant time in Athens, right? This is when Athens, the golden age, very powerful. And so that's what we see. The sophists were writers. They taught about rhetoric. They taught about math and science and literature. They would question everything. They would even question the gods because, again, they, they felt they were stronger and better than everybody else, right? I kind of sometimes describe the sophists as if you've ever run into this, like these some of these um, elite college professors with your PhDs and you must call me doctor and I'm smarter than you because I have my degree. Um, it's that kind of individuals that they, they would be like, right? Um, so that would be kind of the sophists, right? Uh, I think I don't remember if I told you this, but I've never personally been impressed by somebody's degree. There, there are a lot of people, a lot of fancy degrees, but it doesn't mean you have any common sense, wisdom, or ethics. Uh, so anyways, that would be like the sophist type. Uh, then we get to the third generation, right? From about 430 to around the year 400 BC. And this is when things are going badly in Athens. Remember, that's when the Peloponnesian War goes poorly. That's when they get hit by the plague. So it's not a surprise the writers out of this period are not going to be really strong or, or very positive, I should say. Uh, I put the name Euripides up, right? And Euripides wrote a couple of works. One is called the Medea. Again, he's from Athens. And the story of Medea is basically a story of... Uh, <laughs> of, of a woman who's so upset her husband had an affair, she ends up killing her own two children. Pretty tragic, right? Uh, so it just kind of shows you how tragic the writing is at this time. Another one of his works is called the Baca, and in this play, the god Dionysus is the major god, you know, running the play and pushing people to go which way he wants them to go. Now, Dionysus is the god of wine, but he's more than the god of wine. Dionysus, you know, if you think about it, what happens when people drink too much? They get drunk, and then they do stupid things, and Dionysus represents all that. He's the drunk of, he's the god of wine, but he's also the god of irrational behavior. And so in his other story, the Baca, um, he's describing, you know, Dionysus as being the dominant figure because this is an irrational time. So with Euripides, you see the two stories, Medea and the Baca, and they both capture, you know, in the case of Medea, a very tragic story. In the case of the Baca, a very, you know, irrational time. So you have that. You also have Socrates during this time period. You have in your primary source, your BD book, some information on Socrates. Socrates actually didn't write anything. His student Plato did. Uh, but you could read some of that in your BD book, your primary source book, and you have some information there that you can gain on that. Uh, one other name, I want to give you a man named Aristophanes, and he is another Athenian. Uh, he's just kind of like separate than this whole generational thing. He's an Athenian writer who wrote comedies, so there were some Athenian writers who wrote comedies. Uh, his most famous play is called Lysistrata, um, and Lysistrata is the story of a woman uh, who's tired of the men in the Greek world fighting, so she kind of gets all the other women together, and they have an idea, and their idea is very simple. Uh, the, the women are going to stop having sex with the men until they stop fighting. And so uh, then the men try to get the women in bed, and the women say no, and it's, you know, comedy tries to ensue, and that was their form of Greek comedy, uh, the story of Lysistrata. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before. There are other some comedic writers as well in the Greek world. So anyways, that's just a really brief kind of discussion on Greek writers. Obviously, you could take a whole course just on Greek literature, uh, which is a little less than a history course and more of a literature course. Uh, but for us, you know, you, you, you get a little sense there of a few of the names comparing Athens to the Spartans and some of the contributions. All right, so that pretty much wraps up our Greek world. So then the question is, who is next and what is next? And that is what we're going to start covering in our next lectures. Uh, who comes in after the Greeks to dominate Western civilization? So we'll get to that. Uh, other than that, we're pretty much done for this particular lecture. All right, that's it.